So how did it feel to bring Luke Skywalker back in this episode? We saw him quickly in Force Awakens, but now he's back. Well, the pressure was much stronger because in Seven, I had a sort of a minimalist contribution so I can enjoy all the fun, but I didn't have to do any of the heavy lifting. This one, Luke, is more important to the storyline. So, um, and the, it's like the Doctor's Creed, first do no harm. That's what I was trying to accomplish at, at a minimum. Uh, you wanna do your best, you want to uh, blend in, because these are certainly ensemble pictures. You know, Luke's story is only one of many, many that you'll see. The sets were uh, on, supposedly ma more massive than they were in any other film and detailed. How was it working on all that detailed scale? Well, I'm not giving anything away because now they've established there's a casino a set. And I'm telling you, I'd never been on a set that opulent in my life plus 150 extras, extras in exotic makeups and alien uh, prosthetics and audio animatronic alien pets. I mean, everywhere you looked. I mean, I've seen the finished film and it's impossible to feature everything that I saw on set that day. I made a small film called Brigsby Bear and it occurred to me just at the, price tag for that set, you could probably make 150 Brigsby Bears, but uh, they spared no expense because people, the films keep getting bigger and more elaborate because there's nowhere else to go. And uh, tell us what it was like to step on the Millennium Falcon again. Well, I thought, oh boy, it's gonna be fun. Uh, I said to my sons, you wanna go? Yeah, yeah, sure, dad. So my whole family went and the documentary crew said, oh, you're gonna go on for the first time can we film you? Because it wasn't the day I was shooting, I was just in street clothes. So I w went up the ramp and I wasn't expecting to be so moved by it. I mean, it was almost like visiting a house that I grew up in that I never expected to return to. And every detail was so accurate. Everything was the same, every dent, every scratch, every uh, hanging, pipe and oil drip. I mean, it was astonishing. And I started getting choked up. I didn't know why. I didn't want the documentary crew to be looking at all this. And so I said, excuse me. And I went around and sat in the cockpit with my back to everyone. And I thought, holy moly, this is uh, a memory I'll never forget. Because it's, un it's unexpected and it encompassed so much of my collective sense memory of what it was like to be um, back in the originals. You've lived with Luke for almost 40 years or plus. Uh, how has it changed or uh, how do you embrace that legacy? Well, part of it is that, you know, you have a beginning, a middle and an end, and then you gotta move on. You know, there's so much detail in your head that you have to sort of do a memory flush just so that you're able to memorize new lines. So I've forgotten more than I remember. And then you meet these fans that know everything about the movies. They've studied them. They've analyzed them. They've read the novels. They've played the games. They get the, you know, I was asking a trivia question. What was the model number of the Millennium Falcon? This 10 year old boy goes, F one nine six eight seven X five. What you got it exactly right? I, <laughs> well, needless to say, he slaughtered me. But later, I asked his father, "How did he know that?" And he says, "Well, Britain bought the vehicle manual guide that you know breaks down all the your land speeder and the X wings and the Tie fighters." And, but even that, that he would remember the exact model number. That's an extreme example, but you get the idea. The fans seem sort of uh, semi-disappointed in me because I'm not as knowledgeable as they are. But I didn't have to be, you know? I mean, getting back into the saddle is a different story. You know, I have to remember all these things and do my homework and, oh yeah, okay, that happened, this happened, who's this guy again? But uh, luckily I have a lot of people to hold my hand to get me through it. 
Well, at least you did attempt the Wookiee voice during that competition. He didn't, <laughs> Britain didn't even go for it. But I have two last questions real okay. quick in my final minutes. Um, uh, what's the memory you're going to take away from making The Last Jedi? Probably the most prominent memory would be that island, Skellig Michael, because it's not easy to get to the top. Those steps are brutal, and they just uh, they go on for days. But when you get to the top, it is so... It transports you. You know, it really does feel like you're in another world. I only had that experience once before, and that was way back in uh, Tunisia when we were on the salt flats, which is 360 degrees of horizon because the salt water doesn't let any vegetation grow. It's just unearthly. So there I am in my Luke costume with the belt and uh, the floating car, and R2 was there and I turned my back, the crew was filming something else, and the sun was going down. Just like the sun's, it wasn't double, but, and I got the chills. I, I really felt I was in a galaxy far, far away. I certainly wasn't on Earth. And that never happened again. Norway, come on, snow is snow. When we did uh, Endor, we're in the, uh, you know, Crescent City, I've seen trees like that before, but Ak 2, the Skellig Michael was, uh, again, I had that feeling. I, you know, I turned around, I was looking out at the sea. Again, the crew was engaged somewhere else, and I was alone, and oh, I got the goosebumps again. I thought, yep, I'm back.